Who keep our end up? And then you know that they've been playing against the famous old dark blues. I've been lied to for so many years by that club that I can't believe I'm celebrating the first win of the season. But a win's a win. And we are back in a big way is what I'm being told. Because uh, for the last 15 seasons, I've been promised that this is Carlton's season. And then it comes out first round of the season. We get our ass handed to us. And the rest of the population goes, okay. Okay, they were just trying to get our memberships. <laughs> they just wanted us to sign the dotted line and, and come and cheer the team on. They wanted our money for a year. They were trying to support. They knew we were no good. And then the, the thing is, for the last 15 years, they say, look, trust us. This is our year. We're going to do it this year. If you're a Carlton supporter, you've got a lot to look forward to because here we come. For the first time since Mill Hanna was on the field in 1997, you can be excited to be a Carlton supporter. And we go, oh my gosh, look at the faith that the club has. Let's sign the dotted line now. Get your memberships. Buy the premium. Spend more than you should on this club. You're going to go to one game and realize that this season's not your season. And yet, for the first time in, I don't know, I'm going to say 10 years, we've beaten Richmond. You, if you are not from Australia, you've got no idea what I'm talking about right now. But you've got to Google Carlton Football Club. They're one of the worst teams of the last 25 years. And, and to match it, they've got the worst theme song in the AFL. But they did manage to come out and win the first game of the season. Which is weird because Carlton supporters have been, I want to call them humble, but they're not, it's not humility if you've just got nothing to be proud about, is it? And for the last 20 seasons, we haven't had a lot to be proud about, apart from the odd game here and there. But do you know how many times, honestly, do you know how many times I've started to celebrate our breakthrough? I've started to celebrate the rise that's about to take place until the next game. Uh, when we get beaten by 143 points by a team in the bottom three that we should have beat comfortably, you go, oh, I'm, I'm going to celebrate it a little bit too early. You know what I mean? But we did. We won the first game of the season. And, and, now, and now the big hitters have come out. Now the Carlton supporters, who are mostly Lebanese, I'm going to be honest. They're, they're Italian and Lebanese. They're they hang on Ligon Street, or they did when Ligon Street was a thing here in Melbourne, but but now they've come out going, hey, hey boys, we've waited a long time for this, haven't we? Huh? We'll go get some pasta and celebrate the game. What a fantastic performance by our boys. It is so good. I feel like we're the team of the 90s, huh? And then we forget, it's, it's like it's round two next week of a 23-round season. We're celebrating... Like, you know, we're celebrating like a club that's never won a match before. Maybe because that's kind of the club that we are celebrating. That That's actually a fairly accurate description of the club. People keep going, hey, Tosh, you know what, though? We've won the more, we've won more premierships than any other club in the AFL. I go, mate, you know, on, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter how many fights you won as a gladiator now. Like, now that that's 2,000 years ago, are we still, are we still claiming? I hear more people talk about Paddy the Batty than I do about... You know, whoever the whoever the toughest gladiator was. Your, your claim to fame only goes for so long, then it's void. So Carlton, let's stop referring to the gladiator days. The 90s are done. The 80s are... Bruce Stool doesn't play anymore, boys. All right? But boys, you look good. Just quietly, you looked real good. I was really happy with what I saw. Well done. I'm very excited. And this over-the-top downplaying of what I witnessed is, is clearly me just trying to, you know... Just, In fact, I've just spoken about a group of people that celebrate and act in a certain way after a performance by the Carlton Football Club. And what I've realized is for the last two minutes I've been speaking about myself. That was pretty much just a, an accurate reflection on, on Tyson Popplestone's household after a Carlton victory for the last 10 years. Boys, we need you this year. All right. I didn't buy the membership, but we need you. All right. <laughs> Ah, oh, how are we all going, ladies and gentlemen? What a horrific song that is. Have you ever heard the Carlton theme song before? Definitely, if you're overseas, you haven't. This is like a Scottish take on it. It's like Haggis. If you're from the high mountains of Scotland, Haggis, it's... 
I mean, it tastes ridiculous. The ingredients are horrific, but Jed's nutritious. And that's the only way you can look at a Carlton theme song, is it's nutritious. It sounds terrible, but when you know what it does to the soul, you can't not listen to it. And so this year's our year is what I'm trying to say. Here we come. You know, we're only 28 games away from the grand final. I don't want to jump the gun, but I am. I got a lot of swagger in my step this week. I'm, and it's not all because of Carlton. I stayed at my uh, I stayed at my best mate's house on on Saturday night, and he's got a two year old. I've got an eighteen month old, and my eighteen month old I realise is very placid, and he's two year old to bully. It's a fact. He's two year old, lovely. I love him, little Tommy. He's uh, he's my favourite. He's my second favourite kid beside my own. But because of his size, he's got the swagger of a two year old in a one year old playground. You know. So he walks into the room like, bitch, I'm here, give me the toys. And my boy goes, okay. <laughs> That's the conversation. Tommy goes, hey, bro, give me the toy. And my boy goes, I was just about to. You didn't even have to ask for it. And he's a bit pushy. Every now and then he'll come out and uh, he'll, he'll, just, he'll just give my boy a little hip and shoulder. And I'll look at my boy who doesn't speak yet or understand the... Uh, you know, the psychological benefit of standing up for yourself, not letting people walk over you, not understanding that if you just push back, things won't be so extreme. You won't be bullied if you just if you just take a... Like my dad used to say, I used to play football in year six, Western Australia, and sometimes I'd kick my football into the year seven area, and I was too scared to go get it. My dad gave me, uh, you know, the most inspiring and some of the worst advice all wrapped up into one. He goes, Tyce, when your ball goes over there, you clench your fists. And you get ready to fight. And if one of them starts something, you just start swinging. And at the time, I was 11. And I thought, hey, that's, a, that's great advice. I can't see any flaws with the argument. I can't see any problems with the approach. And, uh, and, and then the ball goes into the area. You clench your fist and you get the shit beat out of you. And it doesn't matter how tightly if your fists were clenched. Because the bigger kids don't care about that, do they? They just wanna they just wanna show their mates that they're stronger. So so I walked in with a swagger and clenched fist, but that's all fine until you get punched in their head. And so my boy's experiencing that for the first time. But I was sitting on the couch the other day, and you don't want to be an over you don't want to be an overprotective parent, I don't think. You don't want to be the kind of guy who can't handle seeing your kid get elbowed to the side of the head. You can't cry because it does it does your kid no favours either, is I think a fair statement. I think that's fair to say. If you start crying because your kid's been punched in the head, what? How much faith is your kid going to have in, in himself? There's not, there's not a lot you can do from there. And so, and so Charlie was on the floor. He was holding the TV remote, and Tom came over. He goes, "Bitch, it's mine." And Charlie, without saying words, he he held on tighter, and I could see that. And then. And then Tom, he tried to grab it a little bit harder, and Charlie grabbed even tighter. And then Tom. Tom slapped my boy. He slapped my boy in the hand. And I thought, oh, wow. What's going to happen? And, and, and to my absolute joy, my absolute joy, the coordination of Charlie William Popplestone came to the service. He got that remote. He pegged it at the side of Tom's left eye. Tom fell down, grabbed his eye, started crying. We were in front of my best mate and his wife. Tom was there holding his eye, looking for sympathy from me. I was doing everything I could, not just to put my hands up in the air and celebrate. You know, I'd never call my best mate's kid a bitch, but but I, that was the closest I think I could ever come. I looked at my boy, I gave him a wink. He he looked stunned, to be honest. He looked as though he was, he was the underdog in a fight, didn't really believe he could win it, and somehow he won in this David and Goliath story. But he didn't have the faith of David. He had the accuracy of David and he and he lacked the confidence. But when but when he saw Goliath fall, he said, Shit bitch, I didn't know I had it in me. And I said, Hey, just maybe watch your language, buddy. That's not really acceptable for one year olds. He goes, Dad, honestly. He goes, I'm fundamentally flawed by the the occurrence of which has just transpired in the lounge room of the O'Connor residence. It's you know, a KO punch what punch wasn't what I was anticipating. But uh, I'm never going to underestimate the power of the mindset to overcome your dragons. And I said, son, for a kid who's never said his first word just yet, that was, a, that was an incredibly, incredibly powerful sentence. And he goes, dad, I can say it in Spanish as well. And I said, son, 
you don't need a lie to your father. And he goes, I'm sorry about that. I got excited in the moment. I, I thought for a moment that I could convince you that I could, that I could do it in Spanish. And, and, and I couldn't. But it was an important lesson to us both. We both realized if you can't speak Spanish, don't pretend you can. You can't come out going, La siento, no hablo español, if you don't know your Spanish. That, what I just said there, I'm pretty sure it actually means, sorry, I don't speak Spanish. Because my wife and I, we went through a moment of inspiration where we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to learn the Spanish language. And then we, we, got a, we got a textbook which it told you how to do it. It explained to you what the words meant. It explained to you the structure. It explained to you that with time, patience, commitment, you could do it. You could be in the uh, you could be in the area for whom the bell tolls was recorded. Ernest Hemingway, 1946. I don't know about the year. Say it with confidence, let the people believe. And we got halfway through the first, I'm gonna say 25 minutes of our lesson and we realized we had no interest. And so instead of learning Spanish, we simply learned in the Spanish Spanish language. La siento, no hablo español, which means I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish. But if you say it with enough confidence, if you say it with enough of a, a twang, la siento, no hablo español, people go, man, it's, it's the equivalent of seeing someone in, in Australia go, mate, sorry about that, I, I don't really speak very good English. But you hear that in perfect English and you go, is this guy taking the piss? And, and we had that quite a few times because I, I, uh, I, I bought the sentence out uh, in our travels through Spain and I said it. I'm the kind of guy I like to commit. La siento no hablo español. <laughs> I'm from Barcelona, the Barcelona. You know, I chucked the lisp in there from time to time. I'm not 100% sure if I was in the right region for the, for the lisp, but anyone who says Barcelona sounds as though they belong in Spain if you don't understand the reference to the lisp. Getwelltraveled.com is a website I'm going to send you towards. I'm not sure if it's an actual domain name, but you should check it out. It was me having a go at you for not getting my culture reference. Because if you can't talk shit about the culture, about the countries that you've been to, what can you talk shit about? I don't want to start this with, uh, with too much heavy philosophy, but it seems like, a, it seems like an appropriate question. And so if you're Spanish out there and you're wondering whether I do or do not speak Spanish, the, the truth is I do not. The only sentence I have is that. But I love your language. I love what you're about. I love... Uh... When I was in Barcelona, I loved... they had a couple of little coffee shops there that I was a really big fan of. Because the thing, it de deceptively, as a bloke from Melbourne who, who's been exposed to a fair amount of good coffee in his time, there's, there's not a whole heap of good coffee if you're speaking about, uh, you know, the style of coffee that you get here in Melbourne. Here, Melbourne coffee is served with a, with a whole heap of wank. Do you know what I mean? From the froth to the haircut, you go in, you see a guy with a front mullet, a neck tattoo, a shit watch from the 60s, telling you about how socialism is actually a good idea for the future of our country. I go, cocky, just make my, just make my coffee. I said, "What are you like? What are you doing?" And you have a chat to them about how about what's going on in their life, and they're all. I don't know what it is. It's there's this weird thing about like a 35 year old woke dude working in a cafe. It's not even a 35 year old woke dude who works in a cafe. It's just it's just Melbourne in general. I'm not sure what it is, but but Melbourne, you do my head in with this, and you need to stop. People get to my age, and I'm not sure what it is. But there's an element of wokeism that sneaks into the conversation. There's an element of... This is how every conversation between a 35-year-old white guy goes. I'll be person A and I'll be person B. All right, I'll, I'll go here for person A and here for person B. Person A. Hey, bro. Person B. Oh, hey, brother. How you going? Person... I'm not going to keep saying person A. Just keep up with the conversation. You know, it's, it's kind of difficult to do that. I can't get into character. I've been pretty good, man. I, I, I've just really fallen off the bandwagon a little bit with meditation. Oh, bro, meditation's key, isn't it? Like, if I fall off the bandwagon with meditation, one of the things I notice is like a, a low-key anxiety starts to sort of creep into my system, and it really throws off uh, it really throws off my studies, do you know? Because, I've man, I've been so into Kerouac lately. I'm just going through a phase of, of really appreciating it. Since I've, since I've started to develop an understanding of of like capitalism and the impacts that capitalism has on our society and the desires that people have, I've realized I need to get on top of, you know, my own ego 
and I think through yoga and like an experience in in psychedelics, I'm starting to deal with that. That was a bit of a rant, so let me just say I'm going back to person B. All right. Yeah, bro. I totally understand what you're saying. Like the other day, I was sitting there having a. I was actually having like a soy decaf latte, but it was only three quarters full because um, I don't know. I'm really trying to be careful with my my soy consumption. Do you know what I mean? I heard that a lot of the rats are being tortured when it comes to the production of soybeans. So as I was meditating on what Karouac said, like through his conversation with Buddhism, one of the things that I realized is white people are like we are such pieces of shit. Hey, have you ever realized that? That when you actually just stop and think about it for 25 seconds, what you start to realize is you're a piece of shit. Have you realized that? Back to person B. Yeah, bro. I realized that when I was about seven. Because my mom, she took me to India. And I think the thing with India is it just exposes you to your own bullshit. And if you get exposed to your own bullshit, then other people's bullshit becomes more realistic. You know what I'm saying? And then... There's a, there's a, I, I went. I'm gonna be honest. I went way harder with that than when I. I feel as though the accent changed a little bit. I. I started with one, and I. I got too into the. I got too into the role. I forgot where we were. And um, I, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be honest. I think they were. I think they were Siamese twins. Those people. You know what I mean? Because they sounded exactly the same. And I'm not sure where they grew up. But but you know, I just. I find it hard talking to a lot of people with the same interest in me as I have, have at the moment because we go, I don't know what it is. Is it an arrogance? I just realized how much of a piece of shit I... It's like an arrogance in, in... Because it's not a true humility, is it? Like when we speak about... I just I don't know how much of a piece of shit I was and I don't know how much of a piece of shit you are. And I'm exploring... That's the other thing. And I'm exploring my sexuality. I've never had someone's fingers in my ass before. And maybe I like it, but I've been told that's gay. So I'm not 100% sure if I should do it. So I've just been using my own fingers. Oh, bro, have you been using your pinky? Nah, bro, I'm up to the thumb. Sometimes I use thumb and index like I'm trying to pick up a pee from the floor, but it's in my asshole. <laughs> this, is, this has got to stop. That's preposterous. But do you know what I mean is the question. That's the one question I have for you. Do you know what I'm talking about or am I talking to myself? I'll move this because I'm going to have a drink. Hmm. Because we don't like religion anymore. We don't like religion, but we like uh, we like we, I don't know. I don't think it's I don't think it's unique to our generation either. I think it's been around there for a little while, but I've just started to notice it. I notice it in myself sometimes when I'm having a deep conversation with someone. I, I, maybe I just get too sensitive about the word meditation. I hear the word meditation now, and I go, Oh no, I just sound like that flog. Do you know what I mean? Then I met an Indian guy. This is true. I met an Indian guy at the park this morning. I went there to do a workout and I saw this guy in barefoot shoes and I thought, well, this guy's this guy's going to be an interesting guy to talk to because no one runs in barefoot shoes without putting some serious thought into it. So I said, hey, how you going, mate? Your calves look fantastic. True start to that conversation. He, um, um, It's quite forward from man to man at 7 a.m. on a on a Monday morning, but I mean, there's no, there's no insult there. His calves did look fantastic, but I just wanted to get into the conversation. And he was telling me that he gets up at 4 a.m. every morning, starts with an hour of meditation, starts with an hour of yoga. Then he goes and watches the sunrise. And uh, he was, I thought he was Indian as we were speaking to him. But what I realized through the conversation, mainly the, the, the thing that helped me realize it was, was when he told me that he's Sri Lankan. I thought, ah, I've just, I've just categorized you. But but geographically, they're very close to each other, aren't they? Like, I, I think the land used to connect the two of it, but maybe the uh, maybe the old ocean separated the two. That's how I justify getting confused with a Sri Lankan and an Indian. I just say, ah, oh, there was a land bridge there once. Do you know what I mean? It used to be the same, used to be the same kind of place. But it's not. Just like when Australians try and tell me that Tasmanians are part of this country, I go, like, let's be honest with each other. Do you know what I mean? I travelled down there one time and and I saw a lady. She had six boobs, and they were on her back. And I said, hey, miss, are you okay? And she goes, what, what are you talking about? What's, what could possibly be the matter? I said, oh, I just noticed I just noticed you had six boobs on your back. She goes, are you looking at my boobs? I said, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. This, this podcast has taken a, a, a turn into the hypothetical, which I, I, I honestly wasn't anticipating going there today. And now I'm just making up a story. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a page filled with, with notes, and I wanted to talk to you about what's on this page. And now I'm getting caught in hyper... Essentially what I'm trying to say is I've, I've, li I've lied straight to your face. I'm, I'm lying to you. 
none of the, that story about the lady with six boobs on her back, I, I think the reason I'm clarifying is because I, I'm pretty sure that you already knew that that didn't take place. And, and just to recognize the fact that I, I know that you know I had to call myself out on it, okay? But in fairness, I haven't been meditating, so honesty is not really a really crucial part of my, um, my sort of personality right now. <laughs> That's not even funny. Oh my gosh. Hey, the World Indoor Athletic Championships have been taking place this week. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Africa represent. We just, literally, like I'm the only events that I follow is is the middle distance running. So it's 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 actually only Africa represent, which is it's funny to me because growing up, my, the people I idolized most, the people that I wanted to be more than any other person was an African athlete. I wanted to be from a tribe in Kenya because the Kenyan tribes they seemed to produce middle distance runners that I could not believe. And then at school, in about year eleven, people started saying to me, uh, "But hey, Tyce, who do you think the best runners in the world are?" I said, oh, "100 percent the Africans." They're like, "Well, that's a bit of a stereotype, bro. It's a bit of a stereotype. What? Like, do you think just because of the color of their skin they can run?" I said, "No, no. It's got nothing to do with pigment. It's got to do with uh, altitude. It's got to do with countries. It's just the majority of the people in that particular country have a they got a little bit more melatonin in their skin. Is it more or less? I think it's more. They got more melatonin in their skin." And they say, "Bro, that's like a it's almost a casual racism that you're bringing to the table." I go, "No, no, it's not. It's just a fact that these guys are better than white people." She's like, "Ah, oh, better than white people." Yeah, sorry. I thought you were saying that. I got confused there. I thought you were saying that you were better than them. It's like, "No, no." Like, it was really strange because people, I remember I had a conversation with a bloke a few years ago and uh, we were sitting in a cafe in London and the, the run had got a little bit tense because halfway through the run, I realized that we just saw the whole world in a completely different way. And because uh, he, the, the problem was he told me that he'd gone out to watch some comedy and uh, anyway, without getting too far into it, we just we just butted heads and he started going on about how casual racism is a huge problem in Australia. And I was like, man, what's, what, are you, what are you talking about casual racism? He's like, oh, it's, where, it's where like a white person thinks thinks that they're better than a black person. Do you know what I mean? Thinks they can speak down to them and blah, blah. I go, well, it's, man, I've always felt the opposite of that. I always felt like if there's a Kenyan in the room, I shut up. Because here's the thing. When you're a 15-year-old kid, actually, more accurate story. When you're a 25-year-old kid and you see a 15-year-old Kenyan kid absolutely kicking the ass of your personal best times, you're at the peak of your running ability. He's he's just stepping onto the scene. There's an element of respect when you train hard for that sport where you go, oh, I wish I was that kid. All I want to be is that kid because he's dominating in the area that I want to be. So I found out that that people had a problem with with like this casual racism when I was young, and I was like, bro, I feel the opposite of it. Do you know, I would have I wanted to be the I wanted to be the blackest person I knew because at at, at pretty much guaranteed fact. Pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be the fastest runner in the field. Fact. Google it. Have a look at the first. Actually, this this stuff's up. Have a look at the first three places of the uh, the men's three thousand meter indoor championships. Bloody Mark Scott, UK athlete. He stuffed it for me because it wasn't a super super fast race. So naturally, a white guy can stick around for uh, for a fair bit of the pace and and then just get out sprinted at the end. But he did a fantastic job. Mark Scott represent really proud. However. Have a look at every world record from the 100 meters to the marathon and tell me I'm not onto something. 100 meters, Usain Bolt. 200 meters, pretty sure Usain Bolt. 400 meters, Van Nierkirk. Lighter, but you know, there's something. There's something. 800 meters, David Rudisha. 1500 meters, Hisham Al Garouge. 3000, Daniel Komen. 5000, I um, can't keep up anymore. 10,000, also confused, marathon, Kipchoge. Am I onto something, ladies and gentlemen? The answer is yes. But no one likes talking about distance running. So I'm not going to spend too long here because the fact is I, I learned the hard way that, that you don't talk about distance running with people if, if you want to hold their conversation, if you want to hold their attention. Mainly I learned that through my wife. I started saying, hey, babe, a really good 3,000 meter race. And I would get to that point of the sentence and she'd be asleep. I go, she must have, like first couple of times I go, she's tired. And then I go, hey, babe, there's a great 10,000 meter, bang, sound asleep. I swear to you, I'm thinking about running a marathon. Dead. She died. She actually died. Third time. <laughs> she didn't. I don't need to clarify because you guys know she's still alive because I post her on Instagram regularly. I don't know why I did that high pitch thing with my voice just then. 
there's a weird thing going around at the moment. It's a weird little phase where it's a... They say, bye, Felicia. Have you seen that? Bye, Felicia! It feels so good to say it. But you've got to choose the right moments to say it because I... um. I start using it in moments or with crowds that, that aren't anticipating it, don't really know what it is. And the joy's not... If you start going, bye, Felicia, I don't even know what it's from. I don't even know what it is that I'm doing. I just worked on a radio show for a while, and at, at, at the end of the show, uh, Joy, the, the lovely girl I used to work with, she'd go, bye, Felicia! And I just thought she was tripping for months. I thought that she saw a lady behind me and, and then I started saying it without even clarifying what it was that she was that she was doing. But if, you, if you're in the wrong environment and you start doing stuff like that, you're not going to make any new friends really. Do you know, like if I, I stay with my mum sometimes and I start just chucking out things like that and she goes, oh, what, what, what's Felicia? I go, ma, don't, don't look too far into it. Do you know what I mean? Just... I could maybe just let it slip. Just let it go a little bit. I don't want to spend too long here, you know. Anyway. Hmm. I wish I knew where any of these thoughts were going. I mean, we're here, we're here together. We're here together. As I said, page full of notes. Page full of notes. Let's get a, let's get a little bit of a, a little bit of what's happening in the world of Twitter this week. But before we get into a little bit of the world of Twitter this week, let's have a look at, um, oh, what's his name? I've completely blanked on his name. Guitar Solo. He's like a U Ukrainian guy. Guitar Solo. I've blanked on his name. So let's just, I can't use some of these songs as well because Estes Tony, here we go. Thanks for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a tough day in the Popplestone household. Let's uh, let's use this as the theme song for a little bit of what's going on in the world of Twitter this week. I listen to this sometimes when I'm doing my comedy. You know, it just uh, Jesse calls it elevator music. Okay, baby, that's insulting. But gee, you feel smart when you listen to it. You just you feel insightful when you listen to it. Is is I think more accurate. There'll be no monetizing this video on YouTube today, based on the fact that I'm breaking copyright laws left, right, and center. Estes Tone. I appreciate you, brother. But what's happening in the world of Twitter this week? What's trending? Because uh, I mean, it's an interesting place just to see what's going on. Nothing's trending. I'm clearly on the I'm clearly on the wrong page. How do you I'm not hundred percent sure. This is for a podcast which is required to entertain. I've just done a poor job, but from that's the last time we hesitate. Alright, there's there's gonna be no what's happening in Trender and no no what's what's trending in Twitter this week because uh, I just can't get myself together. I can't get myself organized to bring it to you. So I wanna tell you about something this week because I've I'm trying to work on my ability to be a troll. I'm trying to work on my ability to be a uh, uh, what are those people called where they, they just they throw a spanner in the works, they throw out something that's a little bit witty, a little bit clever. Uh, uh, it is. It's an online troll. Michael Malice does it well. I think he's one of the best. Self-proclaimed one of the best trolls going around. And, and and there's something about the guy I like. There's something about him I respect. And I thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to start bringing that into um, into my own repertoire of things that I can do during the week. And uh, and I told Jesse about this one the other day. She laughed and said that I was an embarrassment. Uh, but I took her laugh as as being supportive. And so Brett Sutton this week, the the health the health officer in Victoria, he wrote a thing saying that uh, there's a new variant of coronavirus, coronavirus 19 or whatever it's called going around at the moment. Very, very dangerous. And so people need to make sure that they're masking up, especially kids who have the lowest vaccination rates. And uh, I thought, all right, it's my time to shine. And so ladies and gents, are you ready for my response? Buckle yourselves up because it was a good one. Uh, the BA variant is uh, on the rise in places all around the world. As kids, uh, as kids are some of the most unvaccinated people groups in our country, it's important that we remain masked up. All right. 
Tyson Popplestone, response. My kid got his mask stuck in his asshole. How do I get it out? <laughs> That's, it feels worse when you say it. It, like, it doesn't feel as good when you say it out loud. And now I'm, being, now I'm embarrassed. I thought I, I thought I got him good. All right, I thought he's not going to be able to have a comeback for this. And he, he, he didn't respond, but I don't think it's because he didn't have a comeback. I think it's because he he probably just thought I was a troll, <laughs> which, which I was. But yeah, it, it's hard to be a good troll because I think the best, I think the the most important element of being a a, a troll is a. Uh, well, first of all, you've got to you've got to have a little bit of you've got to have a little bit of intellect in the troll. Do you know what I mean? And and I guess if I'm being honest, upon reflection, to that that troll attempt was there wasn't much intellect. I just said my, my kid had his mask stuck in his ass, which. Uh, but that's the thing. You've got to just gradually get better at what you do. It doesn't matter what field you're in. If you hang around for long enough, so honestly, hang around here till 2023. I could be one of the best trolls going around in this nation. But at the moment, you guys got to witness the birth of my uh, of my desire to be just that. And uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with you. As I've said it out loud, I've realised that it's, it probably wasn't the uh, you know it's not going to be the strongest tweet that I ever have. I'm also relatively confident that it's not going to be the worst tweet that I ever have because I chuck a few out there. A good friend of mine told me that I hit about one joke in ten. So I thought, well, what's important is consistency. I got to just keep chucking jokes out there, which is you know you risk being highly offensive. You risk upsetting your wife. Every now and then you call your mum a tart. <laughs> but it's all in the name of humour. You can't just be you can't just be uh Mr. Hundred Percent. You know what I mean? You can't hit every shot you take. You can't conceive every time. I don't know why it has to go sexual all the time. But you can't conceive every time you you try to. Unless you're me. Green juice and push-ups, baby. I don't know what's going on there, but I'm venomous. <laughs> That's there's so many things I'm doing in this episode today. Like what? Arr, what? What is that? Never do that. You should never do that in public. There is no place where that's acceptable. You can't growl into a microphone and. And not be cancelled. Tell you what, there's only so many bras I can get sent to me. But ladies, I'm married. I've told you that. It's going steady. And I'm not organised enough to have an affair anyway. Uh, that's not the most important factor of why I'm not having an affair. I'm not having an affair because I love my wife with all my heart. And my kid with all my heart. I love the family unit we've created. But I just, I need to clarify something. Those of you who are having affairs, congratulations on your admin skills. Especially if you're doing multiple I'm not congratulating you on the affair. I'm congratulating you on your admin skills. You know, I don't have a membership to Calendly, but if I did, I wouldn't use it. Whereas you, at least you're committed to what it is that you're doing. Not your marriage necessarily, but I mean the the extramarital stuff. That takes organization. I have currently, on my phone right now, I'll be honest with you, I'll even show you my, ah, oh, it's not gonna look as good because my wife went through the other day because it was stressing her out that I had so many. I have currently on my phone, oh, it's not even impressive anymore. Okay, I've only got like 12 unread messages, but the other day I had 126. If you've got 126 missed messages on your, on your phone service, then your ability to have an affair is, it's, it's, highly, it's highly up in the air because, I say it only because, if you're trying to organize extramarital stuff, you're going to have to say, okay, well, I'm doing such and such with my family and my kid at this time, and then at 7 p.m., uh, I don't know why it's 7, it just seems like an appropriate time. We're going to try, you've got to, there has to be a little bit of back and forth. Because if I was, say if I had a, say if I had a really high profile, do you know what I mean? Even higher than this, this podcast is allowing me to have. Which is significant. It's a significant, it's a significant profile. But I'm saying, if say you're a Tiger Woods of the world, all right. I'm sure he's got people organising his affairs for him. But but if you're a Tiger Woods of the world and you're trying to do it by yourself, it's just it's too much organisation because you got to tee off at eight and then you got to go and do strength and conditioning from say say you played nine holes in the morning. Uh, strength and conditioning from ten till twelve. Then you want the driving. You probably got to have a bit of lunch. Driving range from one till three, and then maybe a fair. 3 till 3.45, because you've got to go back and work in the bunker. 
Do you know what I mean? Got to go back and play the back nine, pardon the pun. <laughs> if you're Tiger Woods and you're not playing the back nine, are you really Tiger Woods? Do you know what I mean? You got to play the front line, pump out the front nine, then flip it over, play the back nine. That's what I've always said. But you got to be organized if you're going to be playing the back nine, the same organized as the same day you're going to be playing the front nine. Do you know what I mean? But you never go from the back nine back into the front nine because it just sounds unhygienic. That's what I've always heard. And it makes sense, I think. I mean, it brings a whole nother meaning to 18 holes, doesn't it? Because you Tiger Woods, you play 18 holes. And then you go have a committed affair with seven other ladies. Is it 18 holes or 25 holes? You tell me. Depends which ones you go into. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to apologize for this podcast today. It's horrific. To think I was a youth pastor. You know, I met my wife at church. I met her at church, which is a it's a dangerous place to meet someone because they're very serious in the world of church, especially when you're young. And there's a lot of big calls that are made in the church world. What do I mean there's a lot of big calls in the church? Well, let me let me just clarify. There's already enough pressure on an early relationship to work, but in the world of church, here's how it works. Standard pickup line from a 16-year-old kid who was raised in the church going up to his girl. You ready? Hey, Sarah, how you doing? Oh, hey, Johnny, I'm going well. How are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good, pretty good. Hey, uh, hey, Sarah, I've, uh, I was praying last night. I was having a, I was having a pray, and I, I just felt, I felt God sort of say to me that, that you and I have got something. Do you know what I mean? Like you and I might have something going on that it could be something a little bit more serious. Back to back to Sarah, just for clarification. Oh wow, Johnny. Um, what did, what did you feel like God was saying to you? We're gonna have five kids. Holy shit! Holy Lord Jesus! I mean to say sorry, Johnny, about my language. I panicked just then because of what you just said. How uh, you bit like genuinely? Are you pretty good at hearing from God? Never missed. Never been wrong. Never ever had one thing wrong. Oh, there's a lot of pressure. Um, so God said this. He, I. So what? What specifically did he say? Well, uh, look, I, I said to him. Hey, uh, dear Lord, please put on my mind who I should marry. And you came to mind. Oh, <laughs> oh, um, well, you know, I've got a lot of faith in what he says. So maybe, should we get coffee? Bang, the date's sorted. Just like that. So what I'm saying is in the world of church, this is how dates are organized. How are you going to, uh, if you call yourself a believer and someone comes up to you and says, the Lord himself told me that you and I are getting married and there's no questions to be asked. How do you argue with it? What, you got no faith in God? Heathen. Heathen. Because what's poor Sarah supposed to do in that situation? I didn't tell you that Johnny's got no eyes and a lisp. He's short of hearing, he's overweight, and she's not attracted to him in any way. But he's used the Lord himself as the reference point as to why this relationship should work. And and Sarah, who I didn't tell you is a 10, also in the youth group is Michael. He's a 10. He likes Sarah too, but he didn't use the God told me we're going to get married trick. And as a result, I, I went on a date like that when I was 20 years old before I met Jesse. I'm Look, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. But I'm gonna say there was a couple of girls at the church that I had my. Uh, I mean, I had a choice. I had a choice of. You know what I mean? I, I had my options. Is is what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I went to eight different girls and I said, "Hey, look, God told me we're gonna be together. <laughs> you and I are gonna be because you shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain, but also you should keep yourself open to as many opportunities as you can because." If you only tell one girl that God told you that you guys are going to get married, what about the other seven that might believe it's true? Because not all the youth girls have their uh, not all the youth girls have their faith as solid as they should be. They not, might not buy into your might, let's be honest, flat out manipulation to date them. And so I went on a I went on a date one day, and uh, it's funny what you notice on first dates. I. I, so this, this chick came up, uh, she didn't come up to me at all. Her brother came up to me and said, hey, I reckon, uh, I reckon if you took such and such out for a date, she would say yes. And I was like, oh, no. Because I was relatively new to the world of church, and I just thought it meant that 
all right, well, I, I guess that means that me and this chick are going to get married. So I went up to her and I said, hey, and she was pretty. I liked her. Like, she was attractive. And so I, I sent her a message. I said, hey, you want to go get dinner? And she said yes. And then we're sitting there and have a little bit of dinner. And she had a, she had a little tiny mouth, little, little tiny. It was, just a, it was just a weird observation. As we were sitting there, I, uh, I thought, hey, you got a, your mouth's tiny. I, I think I noticed because we're having noodles and you only opened it just far enough that a noodle could go in. I thought that was a. I mean, it's no, it's no. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. My nipples are bigger than they should be. I'm not, I'm not here to judge other people's bodies, but I'm just saying it was, it was one thing that I noticed. Hmm. Little tiny mouth, but, but then the awkward thing was old, old Jessica Popplestone, my wife now came out to me because the truth was I asked Jessie out a year before. I've told you this before. I asked her out a year before she said yes. I, I messaged her. No, I didn't. I bought her a teddy. I bought her a card. I put it on her doorstep. But I said, hey, girl, I know someone who likes you. And she spent the whole next day trying to figure out who that person was. So I messaged her best friend, Nadia, and said, hey, Nadia, just trying to find out what my future wife is saying because I haven't heard back from her and I've been anticipating a message back the whole day. And she started, Nadia started pissing herself laughing. I said, hey, Nadia, just when you stop pissing yourself laughing, want to explain to me what the hell is going on? She goes, oh, we just had no idea who it was that sent that to Jesse. And I was like, hang on a second, because I had laid the groundwork beautifully. I'd sent a message to Jesse days earlier saying, hey, yeah, I know someone who likes you and explained all my features. She wrote back, sounds good, too good to be true. Slut. She doesn't listen to the podcast. You can say it. That's my wife. You can't say that. She's, she's that is a horrific thing to say about your own wife. <laughs> but seriously, slut. No, you can't. I said, stop it. That's the truth. That's the word. That's the final statement. All right. Oh <laughs> no. Um. Okay. Sorry. I'm gonna edit that part out. You can't. That's yeah. I'm in so much trouble. One of these days she's going to listen to it and she's going to go, oh my gosh. The things that you say. She's pregnant with our second child and I'm saying these kind of things. But that's the thing, it's a joke. Don't take it so seriously. If you're taking it so seriously, it's your own issue, isn't it? I'm pretty sure the issue is all mine. I'm pretty sure there's a clear line that I've crossed. And and that's what learning's for. But, uh, but she came back to me a year later after I put in the groundwork and, uh, you know, brushed my hair the right way. Pretended I had interest in music and told her I was going to be a youth pastor. And she was like, oh my gosh, now you're starting to talk my language. I said, truth is, if you had told me you wanted to be a pharmacist, I probably would have told you I was going to do that too. But here we are. One kid in, another on the way. Boom, boom. Green juice and push-ups, baby. Conception Ingredients 101. One powerful venom. Green juice and push-ups. Want to have a kid? Green juice and push-ups. Not sure if your marriage is going to survive this podcast episode. Sincere apology and editing. <laughs> I'm going to roll the dice. Let's live on the edge. I hear, I listen to, uh, what's that book called? Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Got to roll the dice. Got to take the ride. What's the expression? Got to cross your fingers and hope your wife doesn't divorce you what they've always said but isn't that incredible just the pressure that you've got to be able to uh navigate your way through in order to get out of a date with someone who's telling you that the lord himself has teed it up because what the lord giveth no man shall take away is either a pulp fiction quote a bible verse or a combination of both but i just remember that i remember it being really noticeable Back in the church, I thought, ah. And then my wife's had friends come up to her as well, say, hey, Jesse, I feel as though uh, God said we're going to be best friends. And immediately Jesse goes, oh, that's pretty much a guarantee that. Because, I don't know, people make big calls when they believe something, don't they? Like, it's so easy just to make a big call. My, um, I, I feel like this whole period of COVID has made big calls calls so much easier because you've got people who with genuine questions and then you've got people now who will just never believe anything they're told ever again i got a call from my mother-in-law last week saying fill up your car oil is about to get expensive which it already was she said but it's going to get worse and then the oil production is going to stop which i don't know maybe it will 
But at the moment, she's she's past her. She's past the time of which she said we wouldn't be able to get fuel anymore. And and so I went to the petrol station last night, sent photos to her, going, "Hey, I'm just filling up my car with all the petrol that they have here." She's like, "I'm so embarrassed." But there's things like that all the way along. You've got those people who are constantly telling you that God's going to return, that Jesus is going to return on the fifth of September, nineteen seventy-three, then the eighth of August, nineteen ninety-eight. Then the fourth of September two thousand and four, and then the dates keep passing, and you go, "All right, are you? Do you really know anything?" Because I believed you at the start. I really believed what you were telling me at the start, and now I and now I don't believe you because you've been wrong forty seven times, and you still somehow you're as confident in what it is that you're telling me as uh, as what you were as what you were when we first got started. But anyway, hmm. Oh, I wrote down this that I wanted to tell you about because uh, Airbnbs are starting to pick up a little bit of business again. I've stayed, I've stayed at my fair share of Airbnbs. I actually, I really like the world of Airbnbs because you get a, you get to be a little bit more selective, especially at the start. I felt as though value for money was perhaps a little bit better. You could, I don't know, it was just exciting. You could plan your holiday. You could have a look at the Airbnbs in the area, and then based on what you could see, you could, you know, you could choose. All right, I'm going to stay here, or no, I'm not going to stay there, or I'll give it a go. And then every now and then you're on a budget and there's not too many availabilities in the area that you're going to and you find an Airbnb. And I was at this Airbnb one night and I went to I went to go and lay in my bed and had these bugs in it. So I thought, okay, that's not a great start, bed bugs. Bed bugs is is not ideal. But the lady, the lady who ran the Airbnb was lovely. She didn't have the most beautiful Airbnb. She didn't look like she had cleaned it for a while, but she had a spot to sleep. It didn't matter if there was a couple of bugs in there. I was happy. If I was a single man, I'm happy to share the bed just with a couple of bugs. Do you know what I mean? Only a couple. If you if you've got a whole school of bugs, I'll spray it with uh, Lynx Africa before I get in there, just to make sure the bugs smell good before they cl- before they crawl on my skin. But but if the but if you're with a wife, which I am, and she wants to share the bed, it's not acceptable. And and so we went into this house that had a bit of a funky smell. And I remember going into the shower and thinking, oh, it's weird. I've just come in here and you know I felt relatively clean before I came in here, but now I'm in here. Uh, now I'm in here, I, I feel less clean, what's going on? And then the shower had a funny smell to it. I was like, oh, gee, this smells horrific. Like it just, it smelled as though it hadn't been cleaned for a long time, which I was, based on the color of the floor that I was standing on, I could tell it hadn't been cleaned for quite some time. And I was looking around and I was washing myself in the brownish, in the brownish yellow water. And it was one of those ones you couldn't tell if you're getting cleaner, you couldn't tell if you're getting dirtier, but nonetheless, it was. Uh, it, I think it was part of the excitement of, of having that shower. It's like, oh, is this actually, am I am I getting clean or am, am I getting aged, you know? And I opened my eyes, I looked at the top of the shower and I saw this dry, almost tissue-like looking thing. I thought, oh, what is that? I thought it was like a like a little piece of paper or whatever. So I, I just, I reached up and I was just going to chuck it in the bin and I reached up and, and it was a... Uh, it was a tampon, a used one, a red one. Um, it was crusty. It was I, I I can only imagine it was a heavy flow because it was a dark. It was a very dark red. And uh, I wasn't sure. I didn't know what to do. I didn't. I wasn't a hundred percent sure. It's just uh, you got a you got a lady's tampon in your finger or. Or a man who's had a tampon in his bleeding ass, but let's just go with uh, with what we know tampons were invented for the female the female monthly uh, the female monthly uh, what do you call it dragon drip that's what they say I'm pretty sure they call it the old dragon drip, but it's uh, it's different when it's, you know, already I, I think the idea of what they are is, is confronting. I think it's a little bit difficult to handle. I, I haven't quite been able to get my head around the, you know, the physiological need for for a little tissue bullet to be placed in there once, once a month to, you know, to protect them from bleeding out, I guess. You can't have people passing out on the floor and I think that's what they're there for. They they're there just to protect people from passing out from blood loss. That's what my friend told me in year six. He said, "No, you got to put them in there because." Uh, I said, "Oh, what? Like, why? Why do they use them?" And he goes, "Oh, dude, blood loss." I go, "Yeah, 
He goes, well, if if it, if the blood just keeps leaving their body, they'll pass out. They won't wake up. Who's going to stop the flow? I was like, oh my gosh, is that actually what they? Is that literally what they're for to stop women bleeding today? He's, like, dude, do you know nothing about the female body? I was like, obviously not. And uh, you know, I could never look at people the same way again. I could never look at females the same way again. A little bit like when you see a girl in year six who's just hit puberty, and you see that she's she's copped a She's copped an armload full of underarm hair, and you go, oh, what, what's happened? Why is that happening? And then you see when she's 22, and now she's gorgeous, but all you can do is think back to that time in year six where you saw her, you saw her put up her hand to ask a maths question in class, and she had, a, she had a thick crop of hair under her arms, and now you just can't look at her the same way. And now she's growing it back because she's a feminine woman, baby. She's growing the hair because she hates the patriarchy. She doesn't care about her hair because it's a social construct. And if you care about the social construct, then you won't grow hair, but you still shave your legs because it's gross if you don't. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> anyway, so that's, uh, that's just the kind of stuff that you deal with. And uh, so anyway, I had this in my hand. And I thought, what do I, what do? I do? And uh, do you ever have something in your hand where you realize it's too late, it's too late to do something with it? And you, My mind starts playing tricks on me in those situations. It's like when I vomit, I always think about the worst things. I always think about, about like vo- biting into the guts of a rotten fish. Like if its, if its stomach has swollen and it has all these fish juices in it, but it's hot and warm and it's just been sitting on the jetty for a while, I think about biting into it because it, it forces me to to be sick but every now and then I have trouble controlling it and and for whatever reason in that in that tampon situation I thought I could put this in my mouth I could I, you could if you wanted to like you you wouldn't I didn't <laughs> just sorry that is that the energy out of the room didn't it I could just, oh gee I'm glad we clarified that did he put it in his mouth that would have been the uh, that would have been the question of the week the answer is no ladies and gentlemen I didn't I just licked it. <laughs> no, I didn't even. I didn't. That's gross too. Sorry for what you're putting up with today. It's uh, you know, is there anything here that? Is there anything here that can leave you uh, a little bit more? Oh, this one. This is funny. Like uh, this is kind of. It's it's funny in hindsight. Cause um. Uh, when I, when I go to the gym, I like to work out with my headphones in. I like it, it's always nice just to have some tracks going in your ears. But but you got to be careful with certain exercises because if you work too hard, you do a little fart. Sometimes you don't know if you do a little fart with your headphones in. I remember once I was doing deadlifts and uh, deadlifts are deadlifts is probably the heaviest weight that I lift. When I'm in form, I'll, I'll do like a hundred, maybe even hundred and ten. I don't mean to I don't mean to flex on you right now. Do you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, can deadlift, and uh, but you got to be careful because if you have a bowl of beans before you go do your deadlifts, you're in danger. And if your music's up too loud, you might have a little whoop whoop, a little uh, a little a little bum sing is is what they call it. And uh, I, I just think you just got to be careful. So uh, maybe this is more of a public service announcement, just to be able to say to you guys, hey, if you're going to go to the gym, you're going to be doing deadlifts. Make sure you haven't got your headphones in if you've just eaten beans. If you've gone to Nando's and you've had the uh, the red bean curry. On top of you, I don't even know if that's an option. But if you have, if it turns out that it is an option, just just be cautious. Turn it down. Because uh, it's embarrassing when you do a little fart and you don't know if people have heard it either. I think that's one of the most embarrassing things. I would, yeah, no, you would rather you would rather do a fart and not be sure if someone's heard it than do a fart and be a hundred percent sure that everyone's heard it. But still, the ten, because if I heard a person do a fart in a place that they weren't supposed to be doing a fart, like if I was at the gym, this is. I was at a gym one day and I saw a bloke doing, uh, he was doing seated, uh, he was doing bench press but with the dumbbells and he used to lift his legs up and he used to have those old tiny blue plumber's shorts. I think, not they're not plumber's shorts but they're like, uh, they're very, very short and I remember uh, looking across at him and uh, and as he had his legs up in the air, he obviously didn't have jocks on and his nut had just flopped out the bottom of the short and I was, he was, he was just, you know, he was working away going, Oof, and the nut was going, Brr. And he would go, boosh, and it was like, brr. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, please stop doing reps. But poor bugger, he was obviously, uh, he wasn't working at his at his maximum because the truth was he was doing reps for far longer than he should have. And I was just standing there watching his little nut just going, 
And you want to go and tell the bloke, but how do you how do you address a bloke about the fact his nuts popped out the bottom of his shorts without wrecking his afternoon? You can't just go up and go, hey mate, how you going? I uh, just want to give you a just want to give you a little heads up that your ball bag was popping out of the bottom of your shorts because he goes, oh that's that is so incredibly embarrassing. <laughs> and then you got to the thing with gyms as well is you see a lot of faces quite regularly. So you see a lot of faces quite regularly, and and if he saw me quite regularly after after that incident, he's going to look at me as the bloke who had to inform him about it, the fact his ball bag was flopping around during that. So it's always hard to know what the best way forward is. So if if you heard someone fart, I guess it comes in the same territory. I wouldn't want them to be embarrassed. I'd have a little quick look, and then I, I do like watching people when they've done something wrong. Like if someone bumps their head. Or what? <laughs> I like seeing people just trip on nothing and then look around at the ground like it was the ground's fault. And look around like, what the hell? Who the bloody hell tripped me up here? I'm just trying to go for a bloody walk in the park this afternoon, and some cockhead bumps stepped up. He's just he's just stepped his foot up, and now I've tripped. And then he looks back, and it looks like he's annoyed at the ground, but really he just needs to lift his feet when he walks. He's been sitting down at an office job for too long, so his gait's a little bit thrown out. He's not 100% confident in his ability to lift his feet. Or, in fairness, he could just have had a really bad day. He's just having a tough... He was, you know, he's just not lifting his feet because he's a little bit upset. And in that situation, uh, you know, you probably shouldn't be so hard on the bloke because he's already had a hard enough day. But I don't know. What's the right thing to do in that situation? Do you tell him? Do you not tell him? Do you look? If you go to the toilet and you flush it, because you need to do a little poo and the whole thing doesn't flush. Do you take the risk and walk outside and, and hope that there's not someone waiting there? I always get nervous about that. If I ever go to the toilet for number two and then you, and then you flush, because the, the, here's the game that you play. If you're going out for a public poo, if you're at a restaurant, you're like, oh, gee, I need to do a poo. You go in there. It's a relatively it's a relatively popular toilet. You know, there's, it's a busy restaurant. They have one toilet. It's in Melbourne, so it's it's uh, gender neutral. They don't care who goes in. Doesn't matter about the fact that I get embarrassed if I've done a little poo. That a little pretty girl's going to walk in, know know that I did a poo. But then here's the get. Here's the here's the dice that you roll. So you go in there. You want to be quick, especially if you're doing a poo, because you don't want people to know it's a secret. You don't want people to know that you're doing a poo. You got to go in, get it done, boop, flush out. Because then they'll assume that the person who did the poo was the person before you because you were too fast. But if you've gone in and done a poo and pretended you've done a wee, gone to flush, but it doesn't flush properly, do you roll the dice, leave the toilet, hope no one's there to see it, or do you wait around, add to the time that you're in the toilet, make it look as though you're clearly doing a poo, but you're going to hide the evidence? Do you want people to see the poo or do you hide the evidence and just they know you did a poo? I don't know. It's a philosophical question which has never been answered and one which you and I probably need to solve for the good of humanity because I've seen so many people walking out flustered. My father-in-law is not one of them. He uses those uh, automatic toilets here in Melbourne. And the thing with the automatic toilets here in Melbourne where, you know those one, those silver ones on the street you go into, it says, your maximum usage time is 10 minutes. Well, he was doing a poo in one of those, and then it automatically unlocks after 10 minutes because they assume you've had time to do your thing. And then the door opens, and he he had to do the old scurry over with his pants around his ankle, and there were people over there watching him. So he's he's got his pants around his ankle, clearly doing shit because no man wears like that after grade two. Happened to him twice. Doors opened twice. True story. Same audience. Do you know how embarrassing it is to have to get heckled to, to speed up your usage time on the toilet? One of the most embarrassing moments you could ever face as a man. And that's why we've got to solve these things together. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't be around for too much longer because I've got lots to do this afternoon. But I hope you have one of the most fantastic weeks that you've ever had. I hope that this week's the best week you've ever had in your life until next week. Anyway. I really hope you enjoyed that. Gee, we went, on, we went on a journey together, is the truth. You and I went places today. We found out some stuff about each other. I said some things I shouldn't. You know, I'm not going to edit this podcast, but I should. That's a laziness factor that I need to work on. But hey, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Pop Culture Podcast. I'm not sure what episode it is, but we're getting through them. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of your week. I'll see you all here next week.